Hey, y'all, buy my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and uh, sign up for the RSS feeds at scotthorton.org, and donate to the show at uh, scotthorton.org slash donate. $50 will get you a signed copy of Fool's Errand. $100 will get you a silver QR code, commodity disc. Any $200 donation at scotthorton.org will get you a lifetime subscription to listen and think libertarian audiobooks. And I accept all different kinds of digital currencies, too. All the addresses are there at scotthorton.org slash donate. You can do uh, single or monthly donations by way of PayPal. And also sign up at patreon.com if you want to donate per interview. That's patreon.com slash Show. And anybody who donates a dollar or more per interview, you get two free audiobooks from Listen and Think Audio. Uh, all the information is there at scotthorton.org slash donate. Also, shop Amazon.com uh, by way of my link. And give me a good review on iTunes or Stitcher or Amazon.com if you've read the book and liked it. Thanks. Wall is the improvement of investment climates by other means. Clouds of it's for dummies. The Scott Horton Show. Taking out Saddam Hussein turned out to be a pretty good deal. They hate our freedoms. We're dealing with Hitler Revisited. We couldn't wait for that Cold War to be over, could we? So we can go and play with our toys in the sand. Go and play with our toys in the sand. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. Today, I authorize the Armed Forces of the United States to begin military action in Libya. That action has now begun. When the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. I cannot be silent in the face of the greatest prepared of violence in the world today, my own government. All right, you guys, introducing Reese Ehrlich. He writes the syndicated column Foreign Correspondent, which we run at antiwar.com. And uh, he's got a book called The Iran Agenda, which he's updated. And the new edition will be coming out in September. His website is reeseehrlich.com. And uh, welcome back to the show. Reese, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, very happy to have you back on the show here. And uh, Inside Syria was the book before that I meant to mention. And so, uh, speaking of which, Syria and your column here, the U.S. is permanently occupying northern Syria, and that's trouble. So everybody get out your map, uh, Reese. This is, uh, what, the Battle of the Five Armies over there? What the hell's going on? <laughs> yeah, it is something out of uh, Game of Thrones, isn't it? Um, well, it's worth going back to 2014, just very briefly. That's when your I thought that was The Hobbit. I actually never saw The Game of Thrones. Oh, oh! Isn't that the Hobbit that had the the dwarves and the elves and the what do I know cougars or something? I can name five guerrilla groups in Syria, and I haven't got wolves. I know that's who it was. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right, check out Game of Thrones when you have a chance. Anyway, 2014, uh, the Yazidi crisis was taking place. Your listeners may remember there was this horrible humanitarian disaster of the Islamic State taking over territory. The U.S. intervened. It bombed both in Iraq and Syria, and the claim at the time was it's a humanitarian effort, it's limited, there will be no boots on the ground. Well, guess what, folks? I predicted at the time, I wrote about it, that there's no such thing as a U.S. humanitarian uh, uh, effort, and that for sure the U.S. would be sending in troops. And first under Obama, some 500 troops, they weren't combat troops, of course, they were trainers, they were training the local Gotta Syrian. add here, gotta add. It was Barbara Starr, and I hate to quote her, but it was against interest at the time. It was more like an admission, a confession, that when the Special Operations Forces arrived on Mount Sinjar there, all of the Yazidis who wanted to flee had already been rescued by the Syrian Kurds. And yeah. the ones who were there said, yeah, thanks anyway. But that was the caucus, but the Casas belly for Iraq War Three, right there. Yeah, exactly. So they just needed the excuse. Uh they wanted to get back into Iraq. They wanted to get into Syria. And sure enough, the uh, we here we are now uh, two and a half years later. And the uh, Trump administration has three thousand, sorry, 2,000 plus troops in Syria, continue to bomb. And the announcement is they're going to stay there forever. Uh, there is no limit on when those troops might come home. 
So uh, if there was ever a classic case of bait and switch, that was it. So we bring it down to the current situation today. The you, it's very complicated, and I'm going to try and not lose you with all the acronyms and abbreviations and all that. But basically, there's a group in northern Syria, in the Kurdish region, that the U.S. has allied with. And interestingly enough, it's a leftist group. They actually have a kind of quasi-anarchist ideology that believes in women's rights, that believes in... Um, uh, defending the rights of, of local minorities. You know, there's a lot of ethnic and religious minorities in Syria. Uh, and they have allied with the U.S. and are being trained and armed by the U.S. The Turks consider that group to be terrorists and therefore have started to invade and send their own troops into northern Syria. And there's a very fierce battle going on in a city called Afrin. It's in the far north East, sorry, northwest of Syria. And the Turks, uh, like any occupying army, have been running into a lot of problems. They've lost about 20 tanks, a sophisticated helicopter in an area that where they were supposed to be able to just sweep in and take over uh, pretty quickly. So they're running into a lot of problems. The U.S. has kind of drawn a red line at a place called Manjib. It's another city a bit to the west of Afrin. And they're saying the Turks cannot come in starting there or anywhere else in northern Syria. So you've got the United States fighting Turkey, which is a NATO ally. Uh, and then in the south, you've got a whole other war going on with Israel, Iran, and the Russians. So uh, the U.S. is involved in yet another quagmire. And you mark my words, five years from now, everybody's going to be saying, how did we get into this mess in the first place? Yeah. Well, not listening to you on my show, that's how. All right, wait, so um, now at the same time that the Turks, I mean, because they're not really fighting the Americans, right? They're just bombing America's friendly Kurds, and the Americans are sitting back and not stopping it. They have an yeah. agreement, right, with the Turkish government that you're allowed to kill the YPG between here and here, but not here and here, right? Yeah, well, not exactly. You're quite right. They're not... Um, in combat at the moment. There's a, certainly a war of words going on between Turkey and the U.S. It has not broken out yet into um, actual warfare, direct warfare. But the Turks are convinced that those weapons that are shooting down their helicopter and blowing up their tanks are provided by the U.S. So as far as the Turks are concerned, it's a, it's a state of kind of quasi-war with the U.S. And there was a kind, a kind of agreement between Turkey and the U.S. about where they, each forces would fight. But the Turks broke that by sending troops into Afrin. So now there's this new line, as I mentioned, drawn at a place called Manjib. But it's not clear at all that the Turks will stick to that. They've said they're going to come in there. The U.S. have sent in military officers and tanks and personnel carriers with flying big American flags to say, no, you know, you can't come in here. But those uh, agreements have been broken in the past. Uh, meanwhile, on the other end of the uh, of Syria in the eastern part, uh, the YPG, as you mentioned, the Kurdish force, is operating outside the Kurdish area in an area near Deir Ezzor. And there, the U.S. got involved in a shooting war with the Assad forces that included killing five Russians. Right. So, yeah, I was just going to say, they sit back and do nothing really while the Turks bomb the Kurds, but then when is it even really right that the Syrian Arab Army attacked? That was going to be my first question on this. Is it even right that the Syrian Arab Army attacked the Kurds there, or was that just the claim of the Americans when they hit the Syrian Arab Army? Well, what's right? It Self-defense. You know, it's so it's so complicated because the Syrian government, of which the obviously the those troops were connected, say, "Look, this is our country. Everybody who's here is an outsider." We have the right to take back our country. Yeah, but the, the SAA has, isn't really at war with the YPG, are they? Or this was supposed to be their first attack <laughs> in that war or something? Well, all right. That's why I noted earlier how complicated this was. All right. Here we go, folks. The YPG, or the, the group that's leading the Syrian Kurds, has, a, uh, has always opposed Assad in Damascus. Uh, but they intentionally did not go to war with Assad when some of the other groups did because they realized how destructive that would be 
to the cities. You know, when rebel groups started operating in various parts of Syria, the first thing the Syria, Syria, Syrian Arab army did was come in and bomb them, destroy the civilian infrastructure. So that didn't happen in the Kurdish region. And um, for his part, Assad said, well, look, we don't want to fight too many people at the same time. We got wars going on with the Sunnis in the south and Saudi supported groups, et cetera, et cetera. So we won't attack the Kurds either. So there was a modus vivendi, a, a, a kind of an agreement not to fight each other, but they certainly did not support each other. Well, now that the Islamic State is on the ropes, that they're not a serious threat anymore, they're not holding territory, everybody's scrambling for the territory that the Islamic State used to hold. So the U.S. has backed the YPG in that part of Syria. It's in the eastern part, and it's key because it's um, the oil resource-rich area. It's where the oil refineries, gas um, processing plants, oil wells are located. Everybody wants to control that. So the U.S. and its allies took over there, and the Syrian Arab army wants to take it back. And that's what that fighting was all about. Mm -hmm. Well, wait, so Assad... Well, what exactly happened there? What was this force that Assad then sent to, because that doesn't sound right to me, that he was challenging the American Marine Corps on, in that oil land with some small column? Well, the, the reports are, are um, not complete. Let's put it that way. Uh, more news is continuing to come out from Moscow, etc. Apparently what happened was there was a group of um, Russian mercenaries, you know, contract soldiers, some of the uh, uh, Syrian-backed militias that fight on the side of the government. And they did some probing actions in a, in a particular city in that area to see, you know, and started lo lobbying some artillery shells and uh, moving up some tanks. Um, it's not clear if they sought to take over the area or just kind of doing testing the, the metal of the other side. And the U.S. took it as a... Um, an insult and proceeded to bomb the heck out of them, sending in missiles, plane strikes and artillery mm -hmm. uh, that killed some hundred people, uh, uh, all affiliated with the Assad government in one way or another. Yeah. Well, now and elaborate on the part where some of them were Russians. Yeah. The Mo uh, reports coming out of Moscow, uh, the Moscow, the Soviet or Soviet, the Russian government says five Russians were killed. They were not soldiers. Uh, and but everybody thinks they were mercenaries or, you know, just like the U.S. hires mercenaries called contract soldiers. The Russians are doing the same and they do it because when they die, it doesn't have the same political impact back home. They can rent them cheaper than paying their regular soldiers and so on. So well, now some Russia, of the Western media are saying it was 100 who died or 200 or something like well, that. Well, it was 100 total, 100 total. That includes any Syrian troops that were involved, uh, Syrian militias. And the Russians. Yeah. So they're, they're not inconsistent. And uh, then, you know, thank goodness I saw where the Russian, uh, I forget if it was an actual uh, minister or a spokesman, basically playing it down and saying, well, you know, these guys, they're deniable volunteers <laughs> or whatever kind of thing. And, uh, and then the resistance on Twitter, uh, one of their leaders, Molly McCoo, was saying, look, they don't even care when their own people die, whatever. When, it, when all he was doing was saying, hey, 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 just because some Americans killed some Russians on the ground in a war, let's not get carried away here, which is absolutely exactly what the other seven billion and a half of us want to hear when Americans, I mean, there should be no conflict where we have a border dispute with Russians anywhere. Uh, this is insane that we're even talking about this in this context. However, when that does happen, what we want to hear is all sides play it down instead yeah. of, uh, you know, trying to exploit it and cause a conflict. And use yeah, it as an excuse to demonize somebody. Yeah, at the moment, it's definitely in Russia's interest to downplay the incident because they don't want to get in a, a direct confrontation with the U.S. They're playing, everybody's playing a very tricky game in Syria. Remember, you've got five outside armies, uh, uh, military bombing in Syria or forces, let me put it that way. So the Syrian government, the Turks, the Russians, the United States uh, and the Israelis are all bombing and or having troops on the ground in Syria. And the danger of them conflicting, getting in fights with the other side by mistake or by uh, inadvertence is very real. So the Russians are playing it down intentionally so that their own 
public opinion doesn't get into a war mood where, well, we've got to go out and avenge the deaths of our guys who've been killed by these uh, U.S. imperialists. Yeah. So for the moment, the Russians are talking it down. All right. Now, so what exactly is the American interest here? I mean, obviously, I know that the Israel lobby and the neocons and all of them, the foundation for defense of democracies, which is all tied closely in with this administration, that for them, everything is Iran, 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 Iran. And yet, I mean, really, at the Pentagon, do they not see things a little bit differently at all that, hey, you know, maybe... I mean, in other words, what the hell is the real point of America trying to hold on to Syrian Kurdistan when, as you're saying, we're at, at the risk of getting in a war with the Russians, we're at risk of getting in a war with our NATO allies, the Turks, <laughs> which would then just make them allies of the Russians outright. Um, uh, we're at risk of, uh, hey, you know, war with, with uh, Russia means nuclear winter and humanity dies. So... Um, what the hell is it worth? A couple of oil fields when ISIS is no longer a state; it's just a group again. We're, you know, um, uh, the Brookings Institution guy O'Hanlon or Pollock, Ken Pollock, just put out a thing saying we got to double down on back in Al Nusra the other day. So we're uh, the U.S. is still apparently on the side of the jihadists there. So uh, what's the point, really, of staying there just because they're there and they have a base and they'll never give it up now? It's all about location. It's location, 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 or geopolitics. So Syria doesn't have a lot of oil, unlike Iraq and um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, which are oil, oil or natural gas rich. Um, but Syria has got its borders. It borders Turkey and Israel and Lebanon, uh, all critical, uh, and Turkey, of course, uh, all critical areas for the United States. Israel seized the Golan in 1967, which was Syrian territory. The Syrians have wanted to get it back ever since. And we haven't talked about the Israelis yet today, but the Israelis have uh, are directly militarily involved in Syria and have been since the beginning or, or towards the beginning of the Syrian civil war. So the idea, the reasoning in Washington is who controls Syria has a big impact on what's going on in the rest of the region. Syria, the Syrians support Hezbollah in Lebanon. Syria and Lebanon oppose Israel. Therefore, we have to back Israel. That's that's the thinking. Uh, now, in reality, in order to carry that out, the U.S. gets sucked in more and more into a spiral, a downward spiral, where you have some troops on the ground. Some of those troops are going to get killed. Then you have to double down with more troops because you can't let our guys die in vain. And pretty soon you've got another Iraq or maybe another Libya or Yemen where you're just involved in a war that can't be won. And this is completely predictable ahead of time. Uh, so the argument in Washington is it's in our geopolitical interests to have a pro-U.S. government in Syria and it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing, right, is this disconnect here because even if America – occupies Rojava and helps guarantee their autonomy or, you know, semi-independence there for whatever period of time, that doesn't really give us dominance over politics yeah. in Damascus. Well, the and way at some point, really, the American establishment has already, I don't know which all parts of it, maybe the Foundation for Defense of Democracies has a different agenda, but it seems like they basically chose not to go ahead and overthrow Assad. They'll back al-Qaeda against him for years and years, so both sides continue to hemorrhage to death, as the Israelis put it in the New York Times. But they never did commit to overthrow Assad, carpet bomb in Damascus and throwing his ass out of there and having their full regime change. And so they don't really gain anything by sitting there in... I mean, you name all the adjacent hot zones, but I'm saying that's why not to be there, right? And right. I know well, I'm not a general, but assumes, still. That assumes uh, Washington is logical. Your argument it, it relies on logic. Their argument relies on power. And basically, the Washington establishment has plan A, plan B, plan C. And plan A was to get rid of Assad. When that didn't work... Plan B was to back the rebel groups, uh, the Sunni rebel groups, uh, backed by the CIA and the Pentagon. When that didn't work, they're now into well, we'll take northern, we'll take northern Syria and we'll fragment the country. If we can't control the whole thing, we'll take the part that we can and 
leave the other parts to other foreign powers. And that's where we're down to plan C at this point. So that's that's what's going on. Even I don't though think, in those other foreign powers are the Iranians that they can't stop screaming right, about, right? Right. So they're not intent, they're not happy about that, but it's a situation they tried everything else that failed, so they're going to grab they're grasping at what they think will be uh, a, a viable plan and eventually they'll get rid of those other powers like Russia and Iran. Uh, but they don't, they don't have any viable plan to do that. So they'll fragment the country. And so we saw that with Libya. We saw that with Yemen, uh, Somalia. If, you, if the U.S. can't control the whole thing, they'll fragment it and control what they can. Hey, people keep telling me, man, you got great show notes on your show nowadays. And uh, that's all thanks to Damon, who's doing the great editing and posting of the interview. So uh, everybody make sure and check out, even if you're just signed up to the podcast feed, Make sure and check out the entries at libertarianinstitute.org and at scotthorton.org for all the great show notes. He's doing a really great job on that. And now, here's the sponsors of the show that makes the show possible, so you should help to make them possible. That's Zencash, zensystem.io, a great new digital currency. It's also a secure messaging app and all this great stuff. Uh, you can read all about it, zensystem.io. And then... Mike Swanson is really my best sponsor and uh, in two ways here. The War State, first of all, which is a great history of the rise of the military-industrial complex after World War II, and then also his investment advice informed by great libertarian economic theory. That's all at wallstreetwindow.com. And now when you follow his investment advice, which I'm sure includes in precious metals, and so what you want to do is go to Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, Inc. That's R-R-B-I. Dot co rrbi dot co for your gold silver platinum or palladium and if you buy with bitcoin there's no premium at all that's rrbi dot co for roberts and roberts brokerage inc and then of course get your anti-government propaganda at libertystickers.com new art and a brand new website coming soon and speaking of brand new websites if you want a brand new website a 2018 model badass new website then you just go to expanddesigns.com slash Scott, and you'll save 500 bucks. Well, you know, I always like to recommend this uh, interview with Barack Obama by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic in the spring of 2012. The title of it is, As President, I Don't Bluff, and that's him promising Iran will never get nuclear weapons. But part of their discussion is about Syria, and the entire context is, Yes, Jeffrey, that's right. It would help bring Iran down a peg if we could get rid of Assad. And we're sure that that's in the cards here, and he's going to be leaving here pretty soon, and we're doing everything we can to help make that a reality in order to hurt the Iranians. And then they joke because Goldberg says, well, what more can you do? And he says, well, I can't tell you because you don't have the proper clearance. Ha, ha, ha. And they joke about American covert action. All this was supposed to weaken Iran. Now you just go forward six years and here we are and everyone's screaming that Iran's influence in Syria has increased, of course, in reaction to Barack Obama's policy. Because, hey, they had to come and help save Syria from the Islamic State Frankenstein monster that America and its allies had created there that got out of control and blew back into western Iraq and, and all of that and had to start a whole new war against the consequences of their actions there. And this doesn't seem to work, you know. I like joking that Bush and Obama were working for Osama all along carrying out his agenda, but you could just as easy say that the Ayatollah Khamenei is the master chess master of the whole world and he is secretly the uh, the real power behind the throne in Washington, D.C., making every judgment call for them about what they should do next. Well, it does uh, lend itself to conspiracy theories, doesn't it? Uh, and remember that uh, Jeffrey Goldberg did a later interview with Obama in which he declared himself a non-interventionist. <laughs> uh, and he, he really believed somehow that he was um, uh, a, a different kind of president who was fighting the, the war tendencies in Washington. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, I think for sure, uh, part of the geopolitics in Syria was to weaken Iran. And so was the, the war in Iraq. Remember, the war in Iraq was going to overthrow Saddam, bring in a pro-U.S. government, and right. move on to having uh, success in Iran as well. And that all blew up. And Iran is more influential in Iraq today than the United States is. Yep. So, and now I think um, all the claims, as far as I know, all the claims about Iranian involvement in Yemen are bogus, but even more to the point. 
they get credit for all this power and influence and intervention in Yemen without lifting a finger, just by all the fake accusations against them. They've, so they've increased their power and influence in a way there by spending not a dime. The Yemenis are exporting weapons right now. That's how many guns they've got. Well, I, I think that for sure the Iranians support the uh, Houthis in Yemen politically. Uh, I think there is military support there as well. I think it's exaggerated by the U.S. and by Saudi Arabia in particular to justify their military actions. Well, I'd like to see the particulars of amounting to what, because all I ever hear is like, yeah, everybody knows that, but without ever any well, specifics there were some, there other were some, than like it, Nikki Haley's claims. There were a few uh, captured boats, and uh, the U.N. did independent investigations. Ah, no. Gareth Porter debunked all that, man. Catch up. I'll send you a link. All right. Anyway, uh, point remains. They had nothing to to fight about in Yemen until uh, the Americans turned that thing into a war there anyway. so Let's talk about Israel and Syria. Go ahead. So just in the last week, the Israelis, the the invincible military power of the region had one of its jets shot down. Um, a, uh, the excuse was that a Iranian drone had come into Israeli airspace and that they t- shot it down. And in retaliation, they went into Syria. Uh, and uh, in, the, is in the process, one of their very sophisticated uh, F-16 jets was shot down. Uh, What's really interesting in this is that the Israelis were prepared to escalate the fighting in Syria and do additional bombing. Netanyahu got a phone call from Putin, and then all of a sudden all of those escalation plans were stopped, and they they stopped with the initial bombings. So the uh, informed speculation is, is that Putin told the Israelis to back off, that the, interestingly enough, Netanyahu is talking to Putin, not to Trump, that Russia is a much more significant power in Syria and in that region today than is the U.S., and if um, Israel didn't want to push things too far. So the danger, of course, is that uh, there will not be an actual carrying out of an agreement that the Israelis will say, it's time to attack Lebanon, we've got to come after the Hezbollah group in Lebanon, and yet another war will break out in a different part of Syria, not where the Kurds are, but in the south and uh, possibly in Damascus. So that's a very real danger at the moment. And we'll see if the agreement between Putin and Netanyahu holds. Yeah, I remember back in 2011, Patrick Coburn said, I fear this is going to be just like the Lebanese Civil War. It's going to go on for 15 years and there's going to be all kinds of foreign powers intervening on all different sides, and it's just going to be a damn nightmare, and there's no end in sight, no negotiation in sight between what are now intractable, uh, you know, differences in sides. So here yeah. we are. You, you thought things, hey, the Islamic State's defeated. Jabhat al-Nusra is, you know, down to Idlib province and whatever, and then here come the Turks and here come the Israelis, the American yeah. Marine Corps. Yeah, nobody wants to allow the other guys to take over. That's the problem. You know, it's a lot like before World War I where you had all these areas, zones of influence and uh, different colonial powers uh, vying for, for control of disputed areas. Well, it's like that all over again. It used to be the excuse was, oh, we're fighting Soviet communism. When that collapsed, now it's we're fighting terrorism. But what it's really all about is grabbing territory, grabbing military bases, grabbing uh, natural resources for the benefit of the colonial power or the imperial power to the exclusion of the enemies. And yeah. that's what everybody's trying to do. Yeah. You know, uh, slightly off topic, but yeah, related. I read this thing at a uh, Tom dispatch the other day by a lady who helps run the cost of war project at Brown university, where they just try to do accounting of all the spending on the wars and the militarism and whatever. And she was talking about how her other specialty is, the uh, police brutality in the ghettos in Brazil and how whenever she tells people these things, they're far more interested in that than the, all of the different wars that America is fighting. You know, <laughs> oh, oh, you're, you're uh, a researcher on all eight of America's current bombing campaigns? Do tell. No, they don't ever say that. They go, oh, wow, yeah, tell me about the Brazil thing. That sounds interesting. They just don't care. 
They're so tuned down. This might as well be happening at the hands of the British Empire. It has nothing to do with us at all. Well, in the minds of Americans, apparently, I guess is what I'm getting. Unfortunately, at. There, there's an element of truth to that, and Americans only start getting interested when our troops are dying, or when the trillions that are spent uh, become obvious and and cause economic problems at home. You know, we spent over tri- uh, several trillion dollars on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we, we spent over a billion dollars just on training. Uh, groups in Syria that went nowhere. The CIA and the Pentagon combined spent over a billion dollars. That's actually a lot of money that could have been spent domestically for education and healthcare and infrastructure and all the other things we need. I think that will change. The attitudes of Americans will change when American soldiers uh, are killed, and unfortunately, that's it's going to happen. We saw what happened when the uh, several soldiers were killed in Niger in Africa. We saw the reaction when um, some soldiers were killed in uh, in Iraq, uh, and I think uh, the attitudes will change. And I think there is a, a kind of a latent anti-war sentiment in the U.S., and it's linked up with the anti-Trump sentiment. And we saw some of it in the Women's Day marches. There were signs against the various wars. It's wrapped so up I in think- some pro-Trump sentiment too. Not too much, maybe, but. That's, yeah, you know. I mean, there's Trump supporters who are who are upset with the fact that he promised to get out of all these war situations and has doubled down in them. It just ranks so low on the order of importance, though. They don't see the cause and effect with the economy and with the violations of liberty here at home and all these, you know, causations and correlations. It's just well, that's, last that's on what, the list of concerns, you know. That's why you've got your show, Scott, to change those attitudes. Yeah, everybody, quit being like that. I know, <laughs> that's why you're listening. Okay. Hey, um... Okay, so, uh, well, no, I, I must have interrupted you when you were on a, uh, on a thing telling us more about Israel. So th- I know there's more to say about Israel and what they're yeah. up to here. Go ahead. Sure, so Israel always portrays itself as a, a, a defensive, small country with a, surrounded by hostile Arabs, by hostile terrorists, and that they only act defensively and they're not like all these other powers around the world or in the region. Uh, of course, the people of the area realize that's never been true, and it's certainly not true today. The uh, I've been to the Golan, and this area that was an area occupied by uh, Israel in 1967, and to this day, the people of that area do not accept Israeli citizenship. This is some um, 50 years later; they are consider themselves citizens of Syria, uh, and you can. Uh, sit in the what's called what the Israelis call the Golan Heights and look over the border into Syria as I did and see the fighting going on between the uh, at that time the Al Qaeda supported group and the Syrian army and the Free Syrian Army. Uh, so the is and the Israelis, despite what they claimed, were actively involved in the Syrian civil war, backing the anti-Assad forces. They had the same problem as the U.S., which is that. The, the, the Free Syrian Army people that they backed didn't have much popular support, couldn't get much military traction. So they made a de facto alliance with the Al, al-Nusra, the um, uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, group, and still have that to this day. Basically, the Israelis will align with anybody who is the enemy of their enemy, uh, if they think that that can get them somewhere. And now that they've run into the same problems as the US, those same forces are isolated didn't get much traction in Syria. So now they're going, turning more to direct bombing. And it's almost on a weekly basis that is, Israeli planes are going into Syria and bombing what they claim are Hezbollah uh, missile factories or places developing advanced missiles. They have a variety of excuses, but basically it's to weaken the Assad forces and their allies. And now they're going after Iranian sites. And it's a very dangerous escalation. The only thing, as I mentioned earlier, that stopped it was the fact that the Russians said, uh-uh, this is, don't go any further. But that may or may not last. So the, the Israelis, and again, uh, while claiming it's a defense against terrorism, what it really is is they um, do not want the Palestinians to have any allies. They want to keep the status quo now in terms of denying Palestinian rights and denying any right to a two-state solution. And um, the, uh, they don't want anybody, whether it be Iran or Syria or Hezbollah or anyone else in Lebanon, from helping the Palestinians or allying with them. 
Now, all of those countries that I mentioned have their own problems internally. They have their own problems of human rights violations. And anybody who's read my books or my writings can read that in much greater detail. But all of that is not an excuse for Israel proceeding to bomb civilians uh, all over Syria. Yeah, well, okay. so but their side would say, yeah, but Hezbollah is building up because they're going to conquer. They're going to invade and overthrow and terrorize and destroy Israel. So what are they going to do? Just sit back and wait for them to finish arming up till they're powerful enough to occupy part, you know, the northern part of Israel or something like that. Wouldn't it? Or do they even bother claiming that? I'm just making that up. But. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I haven't I'm just heard saying, it. Like, if they were making an argument that this was defensive, they would say, "Oh no, Hezbollah, right? What are what are we going to do? Well, Allow them to get missiles? I don't know." The argument is that um, Hezbollah. <laughs> they just come out and go. We like aggressing. Shut up. We don't. We don't have excuses. We don't need them. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, the the argument is basically that um, uh, Hezbollah is a pawn of Iran. Iran is uh, determined to kill all the Jews and wipe out the Israeli state. So therefore, we must do something to prevent that from happening. So if we go into Lebanon and start a war, it's defensive. <laughs> yeah. if, if, if Hezbollah fires missiles into Israel, it's aggressive. So you've got it either way. Uh, whatever happens, the uh, Israel is, is on the right side and is only acting defensively, according to them. Yeah. Uh, the reality is Iran has no ability uh, or no intention of destroying the Israeli state. They have plenty of conventional weapons. They have air fighters. They have jets. They have bombers. They have missiles that can easily reach Israel. And if they wanted to launch a war uh, to annihilate Israel, they could. But they haven't and they won't. One, because they don't believe in doing that. But if you, don't, if you think the, that's wrong... Uh, they re the Iranians realize that doing something like that would be an instant destruction of their country because Israel and the United States, supported by most countries in the world, would immediately bomb Tehran and other major cities and overthrow the government in Iran. So the is Iranian leadership are not crazy. They're not self-destructive. They realize what the consequences would be. And um, I would argue, and, I, and again, I've elaborated on this in my books, they're not for the destruction of the state of Israel. They're willing to accept a two-state solution with the Palestinians if that's what the Palestinians agree to. Mm -hmm. That's the short version. Yeah, but you but know what? The Warhawks then will say, yeah, but you're wrong about that, Reese, because they want the 12th Imam to come back, and they don't mind if it causes a nuclear holocaust because it's the apocalypse and the end of the world, and that's what they're after anyway. And some Christians envision Armageddon taking place in Jerusalem and the ascension to heaven, right? And well, maybe but, the return but, of Jesus. But yeah, well, Pat Robertson isn't the supreme leader here, though, is the difference, right? Practically. Well, but Not, so is that really true, though? That I mean, because you just said that, nah, they're rational humans and they want their political government to live forever. Yeah. But is that really true, says sure. Frank Gaffney or somebody? Yeah, well, no, they... Um, the answer is yes, they are rational human beings. Yes, they're uh, believers in Islam, but the, they've never allowed their belief, their religious beliefs to um, lead them into situations where they're going to destroy their own country and destroy themselves. Um, the, I've interviewed medium level leaders in Iran and lots of ordinary folks, and they operate politically like any other country, which is they're hemmed in by the military political reality, and they uh, th that's why they signed the nuclear accord, just as one example, yeah. um, because it was a rational choice to get sanctions lifted. In fact, you it's know? really telling that the war party has to resort to those kinds of accusations to because it's sort of, you know— unfalsifiable what they truly believe and what they're really up to despite of all of what they're doing because they're sort of conceding that all of what they're doing actually is pretty rational like signing a nuclear deal yeah and you know you you demonize an enemy by saying they're crazy that they'll they'll act irrationally therefore anything that you do is justified you know a preemptive nuclear strike on tehran would be justified if you think that Iran is about to launch missiles on uh, Israel or something like that. So you just build up this propaganda and demonize them and get people to think they'll do anything, even though that has nothing to do with reality. All right. Well, thanks very much again for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, you guys. And uh, that's it for the show. You know me. 
ScottHorton.org, iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube. Antiwar.com, Libertarian Institute, FoolsAaron.us for my book, Fools Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show.